for on our Zoom. My name is Laura Yaris, and uh, I'm a professor here at MSU in the Religious Studies Department and in the Serling Institute for, uh, for Judaism and, and uh, Modern Israel. It's a real pleasure today um, to be hosting our guest speaker, Jared Armstrong. And this Zoom is being hosted by one of our, our classes, um, REL 310, which is our class on the history of Judaism. So absolutely overjoyed to see lots of students in this uh, in REL 310 here with us today, as well as members of the broader MSU Jewish Studies community. So we are going to hear from uh, from Jared. He's going to tell us uh, his story, and then we will have time for questions at the end. So uh, if you could, please, if you have not already, um, please ensure that you are muted um, through uh, throughout Jared's presentation, and then we will have time at the end for Q and A. Um, so, Jared, with no further ado, the spotlight is yours. So I want to first thank uh, Professor Lara and Professor Yael for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, this is actually, as I was telling them, this is actually the first time that I've spoke out publicly to anyone about my journey of receiving Israeli citizenship. So as I said, my name is Jared Armstrong. I'm a Jewish American professional basketball player that plays currently in Israel for Rishon LeZion. Um, Maccabi Rishon LeZion is one of the most prestigious clubs here in Israel um, and for the past 35 years have been on the top of the ranks here in, in, in the Israeli basketball. So I wanted to start off with a question for you guys, um, the audience, basically to, for you to understand my shoes. Um, First, I wanted to say, you know, imagine applying for citizenship um, and your return of your homeland and the Israeli government tells you that you're not a Jew. You know, how would that make you feel? Um, for me, it was very heartbreaking. Um, Judaism and my family goes back for generations, over 70 years. It started with my grandmother and down to my mom and down to now me and my siblings and my intermediate family. Uh, I was born to a Jewish mother and I was born into, in Philadelphia, PA, but I was born to a, a military brat dad and a real estate agent mom. So I, I had two spectrums of life. I was raised a Jew, um, growing up at a young age. Uh, Friday night was typical Shabbat dinner. Saturday was in a shul. My family started a non-denominational synagogue based in the Philadelphia area that pretty much my whole family would go and worship and host High Holy Days. And every Shabbat, that's where we spent the majority of our time. Growing up, I wasn't even allowed to play basketball on Saturdays. Um, even though basketball and Judaism has been my entire life, my family always put education and religion before anything. Until about the age of 12, my parents got a divorce and my family re relocated back to Philly. Uh, my parents then began to let me start to play basketball on Saturdays. And this is where pretty much my first love began. Every weekend I would go traveling for tournaments. Um, we were pretty much, if I didn't have a tournament and we didn't go to the show, we would pretty much have our own tour reading with my grandmother or at our own house if we didn't have time to make it to her where she lived in Newark, Delaware. As I began to get older, uh, my family and my parents realized that I was starting to be, get, be becoming good at basketball. I was getting the opportunity to get exposure by college coaches and starting to get into the recruiting process. And during my time, I ended up picking up, pick up, picking up offers from schools as Kansas State. I ended up having interest from Wisconsin, Iowa, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC. But at the age of 17, I found that I was born with a rare disease called tarsal coalition, which is a foot impairment where two martyr tarsals in your foot collide together and it pretty much impaired my athletic ability. So I, at, the, at that age, I decided to get surgery and it led to me ended up attending Slippery Rock University where I graduated with a fitness management and physical activity degree. After college, um, I graduated pretty much during COVID. Um, COVID started in March, 2020. I was sitting home, 
um, still taking classes. And I just knew I wanted to play basketball professionally, but I didn't know, you know, how to go about it, where to go. And luckily with my mentors in my life and my peers, I was able to find an agent. I basically had told my agent that, you know, I'm a Jew, you know, I'm coming from a small school, you know, I'm just looking for an opportunity to play professional basketball. But in the irony of the situation, I never thought, even though being Jewish, that I would end up playing in Israel. I tell my agent, you know, just if you can find me a team, great. If not, I, at this time, I started my own LLC business of training kids in my area as I had a block, a, a gymnasium on a block of my street. My agent ends up calling me back in about a week or so saying a team in first division Israel, you know, wants to give you the opportunity to sign you to a multi-year contract with the, the upon you receiving Israeli citizenship from being Jewish. So I didn't know anything about the process. I had no clue about how to go about it, the organizations I had to go through, the people I had to contact, and we're pretty much figuring this out all together. I first find out I had to apply through Nefesh Benefesh, which is pretty much an organization that promotes and encourages Aliyah to Israel for Jew Jews all around the world. Through that process, I had to get all these documentations, you know, uh, my, my, my parents' marital uh, certificate, you know, my proof of Judaism, a letter from a rabbi, all the things that I had and the Nefesh Benefesh then sends that to the Jewish agency, which is another a uh, nonprofit organization that helps promote and facilitate Aliyah to Israel. After going through the whole process, pretty much Nefesh Benefesh comes back and says that the Jewish agency does not pretty much approve my Jewishness. Um, they don't recognize me as a Jew. At this time, I was heartbroken because I had all the proof, you know, all the understandings, um, and it, it still wasn't enough for them. So part of that being was from history. Um, my family synagogue, as I said, started over 70 years ago, which was still in the Jim Crow era. And I just felt, as I explained to Nefesh Benefesh, you know, it was nothing that I could have done to fix the situation. Um, I just happened to be the culprit. So trying to figure out what I'm gonna do, I have a, a contract on the line um, for, for three years. Um, and I wanted to play professional basketball. Luckily, it's being in my homeland, and I'm just not sure where to go. Luckily, my aunt, um, my mother's sister, who lives in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, was a, is an active member of Congregation Beth Shalom, uh, which is a, com a conservative shul. And the rabbi there, which happens to be the rabbi to Joe Biden <laughs> at the moment, he wanted to help. So I drive down to Delaware with it being COVID, me and my mom, and we couldn't even speak face, face to face just because of the safety protocols, but we ended up talking on the phone and he wants to help my situation. He basically tells us that he's gonna pretty much validate my Judaism and give a letter to the Jewish agency, you know, saying that I'm a Jewish kid and that I deserve to have the right to come back to Israel and return to my homeland. That step didn't work. And the only step left was for me to convert to conservative Judaism, which was, I felt the closest to how I grew up in my family. So Rabbi Bills and I built a relationship. Um, we go through a whole conversion process for a whole year, all completely over Zoom because of the safety protocols and just of everything that was going on in the world. I felt that the process was great for me. I got to reconnect to my Judaism, um, something that I felt was much needed after college. Um, I got the chance to pretty much relearn everything that I had learned when I was little. And after that year, during the conversion process, after, after the year, you have to do nine months within the community service, within the community to make Aliyah to Israel. During my nine months, I did an Aliyah to the Torah um, and pretty much everything else was over Zoom just because of the state or national protocols with COVID plus congregation Beth Shalom had a lot of elderly members, which prohibited us and just because of safety reasonings. They did not want to continue to do in-person services. So after my conversion process was all said and done, I'm thinking I'm heading to Israel. Little do I know I was hardly mistaken. We both decide that it's great that I take a birthright Israel trip 
which is a 10 day free trip for Jews all around the world to come and see Israel as a whole. You know, I got the chance to go to Tiberias, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and it's pretty much a way for uh, the organization to promote Aliyah to Israel and have American Jews and Jews from all around the world want to come and live and relocate back to their homeland. After my t great 10 days, I'm still in contact with my team. Um, my contract is still not validated because I haven't received Israeli citizenship, but they felt that it was best that I come stay with the team and start training camp. So my team was, is Hapol Haifa and they're based in the north of Israel. And the reasoning they wanted me to receive Israeli citizenship is because that in overseas basketball, all teams are only allowed four American basketball players that are from America. The rest of the team has to be a local player, meaning they have to be Israeli, or if we were in Spain, have to be Spanish, or we in Turkey, have to be Turkey, or they have to be a dual citizen, such as a Jewish American or Spanish American. So they used me, they felt that it was best to use me as a local player as an advantage, also with me being Jewish. During my training camp, I'm still in contact with the Jewish agency, and I'm basically waiting for the date for them to give me to go to the Ministry of Interior. The Ministry of Interior is basically the office, a part of the Israeli government that handles residency, citizenship, work visas, and things of that nature. During my time, I'm, I'm continuously waiting and waiting and waiting, and the Jewish agency finally comes back and says that they don't approve my, my conversion because I've done it over Zoom. Something I felt that was a crazy excuse because everything was done over Zoom and Israel was even doing their own Orthodox conversions over Zoom, which is not normal. You know, I tried to speak to the head of the Jewish agency that was on my case and he pretty much would not budge. So I'm sitting in my, my apartment at the time, just stuck not knowing where life is going to go. And I'm just frustrated. I'm crying. I'm emotional. And I felt that I've done everything in my own life to get to this point that I've been penalized again for something that's out of my control. A few days go by, I let my team know, you know, the update and they decided it was best that they wanted to kick me out of my apartment. They wanted me to return my car and I had to head to Tel Aviv. Luckily through my connections uh, that I made when make, trying to make Aliyah to Israel, uh, I got an update to basically try to go straight through the Ministry of Interior uh, to make Aliyah to Israel. So the next day I head straight to the Herzliya office, um, which is in Israel, uh, pretty much about 30 minutes from Haifa. I go there, I give them my paperwork, I give them all the documents and the, only sad part about Israel is that the bureaucracy here is very slow. Something that takes a week in America takes a month or two here. So I'm literally sitting in an Airbnb hostel with 12 other people in a room, not sure where life, life is going to go, just hoping that God pretty much answers my prayer. Later, and about three weeks after, I get a response from the Ministry of Interior that they denied my conversion and the reasons being was one, they felt that I was a Hebrew Israelite. Two, they didn't, fit since, didn't feel that my conversion was sincere. Three, they only felt that I was coming to Israel to play basketball and so on and so on. After, your, after the denial letter, you have 21 days for an appeal process. So about two, two or three days afterwards, I wrote an appeal letter um, and I, I rode back to her to Leah and gave him the appeal letter um, with, with knowing what's going to go on next. Basically, it became a waiting process. And after that, I decided it was best to go home. This, at this time, it was November and it was starting to be the holiday time. I'm living in Israel, no money, um, living off pretty much my parents' savings. Like I said, not knowing where life is going to go. So my parents scrambled up some money, got me back to the United States, and I just felt it was best to be around, you know, family and friends and comfort and just wait there and see what happens next. During that time, I got the chance to reconnect with Rabbi Bills, give him an update, and he pretty much gave me a, gave me a light bulb 
uh, and pretty much gave me a different mentality to approach. He told me that pretty much I had too much of an American mentality, that in, or in order for me to receive Israeli citizenship, I need to ask any, not to be afraid to ask any and everybody for help. And once he told me that, um, I pretty much changed my mentality and reached out to everyone. I started reaching out to the prime minister of Israel. I started reaching out to the president of Israel. I reached out to the Jewish Federation CEO. I reached out to any and everybody that I felt that could help my case and that be willing to help and support me. About two weeks later from me getting home, I get an email and a call from a friend that's part that was an ambassador of Israel that tells me that the Ministry of Interior wants to have an in-person interview. And this was flabbergasting to me because I just flew home. This was still during COVID. Israel had just shut down the country a few weeks ago because the COVID numbers were going up inside, inside the country. And they said that this interview could only be done in person. So I'm sitting here at a crossroad debating and trying to see like, should I just go back and forth with them and see if they budge? But I knew just knowing the mentality of them that it just wasn't worth the fight. So my parents and I, I'm still speaking to my agent. He finds me a team that will let me practice with them and let me stay in, a, in an apartment with some of their team. And it will help me stay and not have to pay for rent or anything like that. So I fly all the way back to Israel. I, I'm based in Malay Adumim at this time, which is about 15 minutes from Jerusalem. I'm practicing with a team and I go in for my in-person interview, which, is, which was back in Herzliya. The irony of the whole interview was my person didn't even understand English that well. So the whole interview was misinterpretations and most of my answers were incorrect before she sent them back into the headquarters of the Ministry of Interior in Jerusalem. I'm still waiting weeks later. Luckily, the team that I was practicing with had connections inside the Israeli government. And about four days later, they tell me that this process is going to take another one to three months. So this team decides me decides best that it's to part ways that I should find another place to stay and that, you know, it's best that I try to figure this out on my own. Luckily, my agent was very proactive in this situation and he finds me another team to practice with in Hod HaSharon, which is about 15 minutes from Herzliya. I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, I'm practicing. And luckily, as I said, I have a friend that was a part of the Israeli government that's pretty much giving me updates and pretty much helping me throughout this whole fight. During that time, we finally, he finally gives me a call and said, you know, he talked to the, the head of the Ministry of Interior office and that we should have an answer in a few days and that he feels positive about the situation. I was finally happy to hear some positive news and hopefully that this fight would all be over. Luckily, I was wrong again. The Ministry of Interior comes back again. I get an email from the secretary of Herzliya saying that they decided to deny my case. And at this time, it was about 830 in the morning. I'm sitting in the apartment and I just started crying. I'm just at this point, not sure where life is going to go. I've just tried and I tried and I tried and it just hasn't worked out for me. I'm debating about going home, getting a nine to five job and just seeing where life goes ahead of that. I just, I had a bug in my ear to just say, you know what, just try the Israeli media, see if this will help. So I reach, I start going on Twitter and I'm reaching out to reporters and reporters of the Jerusalem Post, reporters of the Harar, reporters of Times of Israel. And I just start reaching out to people on Instagram to see if anybody knew someone that can help. And the first person that I got the chance to reach out to was a person named uh, Amy Albertson, who was a big Israeli activist based in LA. And once I connected with her, she connected me with a, a nice, good friend of mine, uh, Hillel Silverman, who's the niece of Sarah Silverman, the famous Jewish comedian. They start a, a Jewish campaign um, for me about helping me fight and get my right to return to my homeland. That pretty much, is, pretty much goes viral on Instagram and the Jewish community. And I start to get a lot of followers, um, support, and from that, that leads to me doing interviews for the Jerusalem Post, the High Arts, the Times of Israel, 
And I ended up turning down the New York Times, the Associated Press, and the list goes on and on. After my explosion in the Jewish world on Twitter and Instagram, I get a ping of a message from a good friend of mine now, David Ben Moshe, who was also at the time fighting for Israeli citizenship after he been married to an Israeli woman, he had converted to Orthodox Judaism, and you know he just had very much a lot of empathy for my case and felt that he can help. We we decided to do a Zoom call about 15 minutes after he had messaged me, and you know he's getting to know me, getting to getting to understand of the story, and seeing how he can help from the connections that he made. During that call, he gets a during our Zoom call, he gets a call from a guy named Joey Lowe who's a very wealthy Jewish philanthropist and supports Israel, is on the board of the IDC Herzliya Rockman University now. And during the call, I remember vividly, he puts him on speaker and he says, did you just see that they denied Joe Biden's congregant citizenship? Like, this is crazy. And David laughs and goes back to him and says, I'm Joey, I'm on a call with him now. And Joey, you know, urgently says, like, give him my number. I want to connect with him. I think I can help him. And after our call, we had a great conversation. He connects me with Joey. And about two days, I meet with Joey in Tel Aviv at his apartment complex. Little do I didn't know little anything about Joey. I knew, didn't know he was wealthy. I didn't know any way that he'd connect. But just my intuition and my trust in David told me that I should meet him. We sat there and talked and laughed for about two hours. And he gets to tell me about him, how he grew up, that, you know, what his beliefs are and how he supports Israel and loves Israel, but he also doesn't like when the government does cruelty and, and does people wrong. And he felt that in my case that I was right and that he felt after, you know, learning more about me and my family and my background that he wanted to help. He helped me financially stay in Israel and in about two weeks, from his connections in the government, we were sitting in front of the chief of staff of the Ministry of Interior. Before the meeting, I was very nervous. I just felt that the decision wasn't going to be overturned and that they were just stuck in their ways. Um, we had to drive an hour to Jerusalem. And during the meeting, uh, I'm literally sitting in the, in the face of the chief of staff and He's just not budging at anything that I'm saying. Like at the end of the day, he had this orthodoxy um, pres presence of him that he didn't believe that I was a Jew and nothing was going to change that. At the end of the meeting, he gave us three options. One was to go back to the Jewish agency and let them approve me for citizenship. And that option was a waste and an automatic no, because the Jewish agency works in correlation with the Ministry of Interior. The Ministry of Interior has the final say of who's a Jew and who's not a Jew. The Jewish agency at that point, as not only my case, but in many cases, just may stop helping an individual. The second option was to convert to Orthodox Judaism. For me, it was kind of an insult because I had already converted to, converted to being a conservative Jew, which I felt both me and my rabbi felt that I didn't need to do. Plus, the process was very strenuous. It was a two-year process just to convert, and then another two-year process um, afterwards that you had to have active in the community, and they only wanted me to do it in Israel. So this was an automatic no for me as well. The third option afterwards was for the chief of staff to go back to Ayala Shaket, who was the head of the Ministry of Interior at the time, and let them try to come up with a decision of how we should go about this. So Joey and I on the way back, um, we spoke to a few of his friends and a few of my friends that I had made connection with in the Jewish agency that was is no longer with them anymore. But they felt that option three was the smartest and most strategic option. We chose option three, and in about after a week, we heard back from the Jewish, we heard back from the Ministry of Interior that Ayala Shaket and her chief of staff had decided that they would grant me an Israeli citizenship that this process would take about a month and you know, I, I would just need to stay in Tel Aviv and pretty much stay out of trouble and you know, go on from there. So we trusted him, um, Joy and I was very happy about the decision, but little did we know that the government lied to us. About after a month, 
Um, from not hearing anything, Joy reaches out to the chief of staff and he basically tells us that he meant a month, but a month could be a month or it could be three months or it could be six months. Um, and Joey is a very, and I are very two stand up individuals that we believe your word is your bond. If you tell us a month, you know, be fair. And I felt it was very unfair because number one, at this time I was here in Israel illegally. I didn't have a work visa, so I was unable to work. I'm just living in a hostel, um, luckily with the help of Joey, and just like, again, not knowing where life is gonna go. So we both felt they didn't care about my situation. They didn't care about uh, how I felt or you know what I was going through. So we decided to go back to the media, and during this time, Ayala Shaket had just given a Russian oligarch citizenship. He had flew into the country and in four days he was he was granted citizenship and he flew back out. And the word was because of the Russian Ukrainian war that he was trying to escape being extradited. After the after I decided to go to the media, that became the headline that Ayala Shaket granted a Russian oligarch citizenship, but it, me a Jew, she does not want to. That became the headline for the Jerusalem Post the JTA, the Times of Israel, and it created again more media pressure for the government to decide what they wanted to do in my situation. The chief of staff then became frustrated at me and Joey. Um, he felt that we couldn't be trusted and he decided not even to work with us anymore. He gave us another direct line to call and pretty much go from there. But Joey and I felt it still wasn't enough, so we kept the media pressure on for a little bit. And still during that time, Ayala Shaket decided to grant a Portuguese uh, soccer player citizenship and still did not want to grant me one. Her reasoning was she felt that he could promote the Israeli uh, national soccer team um, as they were trying to make, I think, pass the World Cup. After that, um, we got a call finally from the, from the Ministry of Interior that they would grant me citizenship, but the first step process was that I would have to get a residency visa. Joey and I knew that that weren't a part of the process and that that just, it just didn't make sense, so we declined it. And they were very frustrated at us. They were telling us, this is the process, you know, this is what you had to do. But under the law in Israel, a residency, in order to get residency, you have to keep the residency uh, status for a year before you can get uh, Israeli citizenship. So we felt that the government was lying to us again, that they'll tell me I'm getting, uh, you know, residency status and then I'll have to wait a year and I won't have citizenship in time to get another job for basketball. Also during this time, I'm consistently working out. I was stressed. I was about 215 pounds. Now I weigh about 180 pounds. So I lost 40 pounds throughout the duration of this whole process, but I'm just not sure where life's going to go. And it's just hard waking up, wanting to go work out, wanting to go play basketball, you know, not having a job, not around family, and just pretty much living in a hostel with 12 people in a room, explaining your situation and everybody just sympathetic and empathizing with you or what to do. Finally, after, you know, Joey speaking to his connections, you know, we felt it was time to you know, give it a chance and we decide to take the residency status. So I went into the Ministry of Interior's office here in Tel Aviv and they gave me residency status and they would say after a month that I would receive Israeli citizenship. Still with uncertainty, um, like I said, not sure where life was gonna go. Uh, I ended up staying in Israel the whole month. Um, at this point, I was finally not illegal and I waited that time and again in the hostel, just waiting to receive Israeli citizenship and finally be able to go home to see my family. After about a month and a half, um, we finally made a date for me to receive my Israeli citizenship. And during this time, I learned that I still would not receive citizenship as a Jew. Uh, I ended up receiving citizenship under a section 9C in the Ministry of Interior, which they can, the minister can decide to grant citizenship to a person under this law if they feel that they are a promotion or an asset to the state of Israel. During that time, I was very insulted. Um, I didn't even speak to the media. My rabbi was very insulted because for me, you know, what if the end goal is to stay in Israel? Um, 
as I felt, they only looked at me as a basketball player and they felt that I was trying to take advantage of the system, which was not the case. And it's still not the case to this day. For my rabbi, still now to this day, he's very frustrated because number one, um, legally, I cannot be married in Israel if I find an Israeli woman because I'm not considered a Jew. Two, I didn't receive any of the health benefits. I didn't receive any of the financial assistance. I don't get to go to Opon to learn Hebrew. Um, every benefit that a, a new Olim may get when receiving Israeli citizenship, I did not receive. Um, the only thing that I did receive basically was a two dots of hoot and proof that I'm an Israeli citizen. So in all, I just felt that they gave me Israeli citizenship because of the pressure that I had built upon through my connections. And in all, I want people from this story to learn that even though this was my hardest tragedy in life, this was my biggest blessing. Um, I'm here in Israel playing basketball, living my dream in my homeland. You know, I got the opportunity to meet new people every day. I got the opportunity to adopt a new culture. Uh, I have family and friends here now. And for me, it's, it's, it's been a time that I learned a lot about myself, a lot about my character, who I am as a person. And I feel like as humans, we all go through adversity in life and that it's not about what you go through, it's how you go through it. Um, as I was speaking to Professor Yael, um, who was saddened about the situation, uh, I just think, think that in all, uh, I was, it, was, it was my biggest blessing. You know, I became a better person. Uh, my character was tested and I learned um, a lot about who I am from the situation. You know, I could have easily quit, but it, it would have never showed who I am. The ministry would have won, um, not only for my case, but for many others that fought for citizenship that just decided not to keep going. I just felt from, from my heart inside that it was meant for me to fight. And as all of us as Jews, that's what we have done for the past hundreds and thousands of years was to fight and keep going. So that's my story and I hope you enjoyed. Wow, Jared, thank you so much. Um, that was such a, a sobering tale and um, I'm sure that uh, folks will have um, questions and um, uh, things that they would would like to, to talk to you about but thank you so much for for sharing um, your story. Um, folks at this time we are able to to open it up to questions um, so you can ask your question by um, unmuting um, and asking your question directly to Jared um, or you can put it in the chat and I will um, put that question for you. So we'll just take a couple of minutes. Again, you can either unmute and ask directly to Jared um, or you can um, put your question in the chat. Uh, Sydney, thank you so much for kicking us off. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was the um, whole time I was thinking like, wow, that is, um, that really takes a lot of like self-determination and strength to overcome all that you have. Um, but I, I was curious, when were you granted citizenship? So I received citizenship in June, 2022. So this year will be, this upcoming June will be one year that since I received citizenship. Was that the end of June? Yeah, about June 28th is was the exact date. Was there anything like political about that? Because I know like Joe Biden visited Israel yes. um, so, in July. Yep. So to answer your question, the Ministry of Interior wanted to grant me citizenship before Joe Biden arrived to Israel. Um, run reasoning being because my rabbi has a very close relationship with Joe Biden. And they also wanted to pretty much give him a good pat on the back that they've done something good for an American citizen. Um, and that was at the time being me. So I even did interviews um, on TV about it afterwards uh, that, you know, and that was the word I got that they wanted to tell Joe Biden that they gave his rabbi's congregant um, citizenship before he arrived to Israel. Thank you so much, uh, Jared, for uh, that question, for that context. Um, Lily and then David. 
I want to start by saying thank you for your presentation and just, you know, speaking with us. Um, and my question to you was, you had mentioned that, like, in regards to your citizenship, they sort of, like, you don't have all the rules and, like, you didn't get all the things that other people do. But you traditionally are Jewish, like you, it was passed down from your mother and it runs in your family. Like, do you plan or can you fight that at all if you per want to pursue living there full time forever? So I can basically my citizenship is basically just I'm a citizen. Um, I can fight it. Uh, the guy that I mentioned, Joey Lowe, um, has a, is trying to get a, a meeting with Dor the new Jewish agency head. And that's basically our argument is that, you know, I did a conversion process, even though I was born to a Jewish mother, um, that, you know, I qualify for citizenship. You know, they pretty much deny me because I did my conversion process over Zoom. But what will be the reasoning now? I mean, I haven't got the opportunity to speak to the Jewish agency about it, but that would be my argument down the line if I, you know, if I wanted to live and stay in Israel. Got you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jared, we have um, we have a, a wide audience here. You know, some folks who have been learning about uh, Judaism this semester, um, others who might have a bit more background. Maybe for for folks who are particularly in the class, could you tell us um, what does it mean to sort of convert to Judaism? What kind of what does that process look like? You know, we've, you've mentioned a, a few times about being born of a, of a Jewish mom. That's really, really significant. You know, particularly for our students um, who are learning about Judaism for the first time. Could you talk about about that, uh, that process, that landscape? So uh, the to give context of why I say I was born to a Jewish mother is because the American mentality of Judaism is very different from the Israeli mentality of Judaism. Um, as I stated, since my family's synagogue is non-denominational, which is about 2% of within the Jewish community considers themselves um, non-denominational. In the state of Israel, you, by law to make citizenship, you either have to be an Orthodox Jew, a conservative Jew, a reformed Jew, or an Algatarian uh, Jew. And for, for that, uh, the, for the process, the conversion process is a two year by the law of return. It's a two year process. The first year um, they say, like if it was not a Zoom, that you have to do an in-person teaching with, with a rabbi that's an ordained rabbi by the rabbinu. So they have to be an Orthodox rabbi, a reform rabbi, a conservative rabbi. That's a part of basically the rabbinical assembly, meaning they went to a rabbinical school. And after that year, in order for you to qualify for uh, citizenship or to apply for to make Aliyah, you have to do nine months within the community, uh, meaning, you know, you have to go to Shabbat, you have to, the, the rules of what you have to do don't um, really matter, but you have to be a part of the community for nine months. Uh, basically, that rule is in the state that somebody just doesn't convert to Judaism and doesn't want to have really anything to do with the religion, but just wants to come to Israel. Uh, that would, that's what I was told why that nine months is added and is applied. Um, for me, I did the whole total, as I stayed the whole year and, and nine months, and then I went on a birthright trip to Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving us that context. Um, David, I saw your hand up with a question. Yes. Uh, earlier in your story, you had mentioned how they didn't want to grant you citizenship because they said that your conversion wasn't sincere. I wanted to just ask you how <sighs> how that make you feel when they had told you that. Um, I'm a big believer, as I stated. I wrote an op op-ed about my uh, journey, and I does I don't believe people can tell you what's in your heart. Um, I just felt that they looked at the color of my skin. They saw that I was an athlete which is very common here, like any uh, African-American Jew that plays basketball here in Israel, um, they don't believe that you're really Jewish. I mean, till this day, I have people that tell me like, you're really Jewish, how? Or uh, how much did you pay for citizenship? Like most 
most of the Israeli mentality here about African American Jews that specifically play sports is that you either converted to Judaism, which I technically did, or if you didn't convert, you're married to a woman here and that's how you got citizenship. But to specifically answer your question, I mean, for me, I was very heartbroken. Um, I told him in, in my op-ed uh, that's open to the public that, you know, I just felt that they just looked from the outside and didn't really even, they don't give you, a, they don't give the chance to really get to know you, who you are as a person. I mean, the ministry is looking at a file, they're looking at a picture and they're making uh, subjections and comments and statements about who they think you are. So that, to answer your question, that's personally how I feel. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. We've got lots of questions coming in, some in the chat and some on the screen. Um, so I'm going to do a question from the, the chat and then, uh, Yael, if you'd like to ask your question afterwards. So a question from the chat. You've had a lot of setbacks throughout this whole process. How did you stay positive with all of the trials that you went through? It's a beautiful question. <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't. But I knew, I knew uh, deep down inside that it was going to happen. I just didn't know when and how. Like, I was very emotional. Like, I went, like, as they say, I went through blood, sweat, and tears um, to receive Israeli citizenship. But I, 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 I would really say it was more so the positivity it was a little bit of me, but it was more so my parents. Um, my mom is, she's not the most religious, but she is religious. And she's big on scriptures and Torah. And she just will always try to keep me positive. Like, you know, son is going to work out. Uh, and she would send me scriptures and she would call me on WhatsApp and, you know, try to keep me positive. And she always used to tell me, like, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. So as I got closer to the end, I started to be, you know, positive. But in the beginning, I was, I mean, I was very emotional. I was insecure. I didn't know pretty much where life was going to go. I mean, I was 23. Um, I didn't have any money. I was living at home. And like I said, COVID uh, was how the, how the world was at the moment. So I just wasn't sure what, what was going to happen. So I, I would say pretty much my community, like my rabbi, my mom, my dad, uh, my siblings, they all pretty much kept the positivity, positivity in me, um, more so myself. I, I just tried to stay numb. Um, I didn't want to get too high. I didn't want to get too low. I tried to just stay right in the middle. Thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, Al, you have a question. Yeah. Um, thanks for sh uh, sharing your story, Jared. I think it was really heartbreaking um, for all of us to listen to. And I really admire your perseverance um, and your ability to kind of separate <laughs> kind of uh, some of these uh, bad experiences with the Israeli government with other positive experiences you've had as well. My question is, and um, you uh, and you've answered already part uh, you know part of it that it seemed clear that an element of this was racist um, uh, in terms of the restrictions to this, um, and perhaps another element you know is just the monopoly of the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox over defining who is a Jew at times. Um, and, and maybe part of it is that Yelit Shaked comes from this very conservative, conservative uh, political party. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know, like, so I, and, and, and so racism is a definite part of it. Um, but I also didn't know, especially for students in the class, if they also kind of and I'm sure, you know, probably Professor Yaris, Yaris has already, you know, talked about this, or I don't know, but the, the, the part of this is also kind of the monopoly of, um, you know, certain denominations in Israel over others, and, and generally not respecting uh, often yeah. reformed ju jury and conservative jury and things like that. So I wanted you to maybe speak to that, and also perhaps um, some of the NGO work you do, how it is on your basketball team, how how... How have um, other things gone for you, you know, um, uh, in the past year? But yeah. So basically, uh, for to answer our first question about the ultra orthodox monopoly, I mean, as you see today, I don't know if many of you follow the Israeli news, but there's a lot of protests going on about the judici ju judicial system here in Israel. I have a lot of friends um, that's Israeli activists that actually helped my case, um, that's running the front line of this whole situation. But here in Israel. Uh, the way they view American jewelry and American, I would say Judaism as a whole, he, compared to us as America, is not the same. 
Um, here you have Haredi, you have, which are like ultra, ultra Orthodox. If you don't know, you have the modern Orthodox, you have uh, just Orthodox people, conservative and reform. Most people, just so people, people listening can understand the country dynamic. Most people that live in Tel Aviv um, that are young are most liberal uh, Jews. There's a lot of American jewelry that lives in Tel Aviv. Uh, you have Jerusalem where there's a lot of some liberal Jews. There's more modern Jews. There are a lot of uh, Haredi Jews. And even I live in Rishon Letion. A lot of my building is ultra Orthodox and um, Haredi Jews that lives in my, in my personal building. Uh, for my case, I believe in my personal experience, the way the country views American jewelry, uh, they personally told me in my meeting that they don't know what reform Judaism is. And I, I was very heartbroken by that. They kind of respect conservative Judaism. It's kind of played in between the middle and they really only believe in all the ultra and modern Orthodox world, ultra Orthodox world. Um, I'm very saddened by that. I believe that there should be change, but just how people culturally live and are grown up in Israel, in my opinion, is why it, it is where it is. I mean, I personally have teammates, um, one who's, who's a modern Orthodox Jew, and he doesn't believe in Reformed Judaism. He thinks it's personally a detriment to society. And I have literally have arguments with him in my own locker room about it. Uh, personally, on a personal level, um, since I received citizenship, I have a basketball training business. I run uh, basketball camps that I'm actually starting this summer with the Jewish community and the areas that I live in. I live in Philadelphia, if uh, any of you did not know, but I have a, a basketball camp in Wilmington, Delaware, and I'm having a basketball camp in the Philadelphia area. And I'm also being a guest speaker for a week at a camp or my camp in Philadelphia. So uh, since my Israeli citizenship, I've been able to kind of go on a positive note about things. I mean, I'm, as I was telling Professor Yael, I've been blessed here to live in Israel for the past year. Um, I work two hours a day, um, even though it's maybe a strenuous two hours. The rest of my day is pretty much connecting with people, um, with Jews all around the world. Um, I'm starting a nonprofit organization uh, to help fight back anti-Semitism, hate, racism, and to kind of help connect back to Black and Jewish relations. And I love Israel. I mean, this is like a second home to me. I feel safer here in Israel than I do in America. And uh, I, I met so many new people here from a business aspect, from a personal level. Um, and I have people that I feel like are family here now. And I can really call this a second, second home forever. So I, I hope to play as long as I can and um, be able to be an asset to the country, what I got citizenship for, and to you know help and contribute in any type of way. Thank you, Jared. I have another question from the chat, and then I see that, that Eli has a question as well. So the question from the chat. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I was wondering how the other Israeli players you've met throughout this process have reacted to the trials that you've been put through. So I didn't, as far as support, I didn't get much support from Israeli players. Um, most of my support came from American jewelry. Um, Israelis here, um, at all didn't support my case. All of my pressure was built only from the media. Um, and a lot of my, through my connections, which were mostly American um, ambassadors and uh, people that work in the government that are American, I didn't get any support from the league or any players or any of that um, nature. It's, it's, it's kind of, a, it's, it's sad, but it's kind of a norm for African Americans that play sports to have uh, problems getting Israeli citizenship. It's not normal. It's about, I can name, I may be the only person in the Israeli league that's African-American and that has uh, dual citizenship. I have a friend that uh, played in the league about for 15 years and he had pr a problem with his conversion process. And obviously he, he gave me his support, but 
he told me it was the norm here. I mean, they get problems for most African American males that either marry an Israeli woman or or try to convert or may be from descent of uh, born to a Jewish mother. Um, so for me, it's, it's I didn't get any support. It was very unfortunate because uh, here in Israel, many of the big time players have influence in the media, in the government, and it it, it just is not you know the way. The Israeli players work here, to be honest. Thank you, Jared. Eli. Yes, of course. First off, of course, thank you for uh, coming here to talk to us today. And uh, secondly, uh, one of the things I noticed there is how you mentioned at one point you were accused of being a Hebrew Israelite. Uh, first off, based on knowing their history, I'm sorry to hear that anyone who grew up Jewish had to deal with being accused of that. Uh, but how is it, uh, has it been like jarring to you having to go through all of this here while also uh, back in the States, there have been multiple assaults between African-American and Jewish relations? Um, for Eli and Jared, I'll, I'll just uh, interject if I, if I may. Some of us uh, on the okay. call might not be familiar with the term Hebrew Israelite and okay. and that community. Could you just maybe sort of say a word about um, that accusation and why it might have been leveled at you? So there is a city here in Israel called Demona where pretty much a lot of Hebrew Israelites live. Um, I've actually had this conversation with, I don't know if many of you know a guy named Rudy Rockman, but he's like the biggest Israeli activist um, and supporter of Israel. He's a good friend of mine. And he's literally just had this topic about Hebrew Israelites. Um, and I think it'd be great if any of you guys have the time to watch it on YouTube, but there's a lot of nuances of the situations because there's a lot of sectors of Hebrew Israelites. There's some that support Israel, there's some that hate Israel. There's some that, from my understanding, that believe in Christianity. Um, so it's a lot of nuances from the situation. But for me, it was it was pretty much an insult. I mean, they looked at the color of my skin. They automatically thought that I was from Demona or wanted just like I said, come to Israel to play basketball. But they didn't actually get to know me as a person. They didn't under, try to get to understand who I was, where I came from, who my family was. Um, because my families have my family has been claimed to be Hebrew Israelite and they're not. Uh, my family clearly supports Israel. They've been in the Knesset, which is a part of the Israeli government. Um, they have a lot of connections here in Israel. And for me, uh, even though I converted to uh, Judaism, it, it was just a big insult for me. And why would I convert if I was a Hebrew Israelite? It just all didn't make sense personally for me. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for explaining that and giving everybody that additional context. Um, we have a couple minutes for um, some more questions, if anybody has an additional question. Any additional questions for Jared? I saw somebody in the chat that just wrote something. Oh, somebody just um, wrote, uh, thank you. I shared a link, Jared, to your op-ed to your wonderful uh, op-ed for people to, to read in the chat. Oh, yeah, I see Brennan's question. Um, Brennan, thank you so much. Um, so Brennan's question is, how did you manage the workload between trying to resolve this whole issue and building your basketball career, especially since you stated that you received no support from the league or the team? So during the time that I was fighting for city citizenship, I wasn't pretty much, I had like a few teams that allowed me to practice with them, but my con the trick of the whole trade was my contract wasn't valid until I received Israeli citizenship. So technically the team didn't know me anything. Um, I didn't know the team anything. And for me, it was very, very hard. I mean, I'm literally on the front lines. I didn't have anybody other than like my friends that were activists. I didn't really have anybody, um, you know, doing everything for me. I mean, I was reaching out to everybody, I was reaching out to you know, ambassadors, friends that were helping me. And I cared about it so much that I wanted things to happen so quickly, even though it was out of my control. Um, so for me, I, I was to the point, like I didn't know if I was gonna play basketball anymore. So I would literally just wake up in the hospital I was staying in. I had got a membership to the gym. 
I would work out, go home, and the rest of my day was basically trying to figure this whole situation out. I mean, it, it, I had put pretty much my heart into it that this was the end all be all. Either I'm, I'm either gonna get it or I'm not. And I didn't wanna have the excuse that if I didn't get it, that I didn't give it my all. So um, since I didn't have any support from the league, I just, in my own gut and how I was raised, like you either give it your all or you don't. So I pretty much would work out and the other type of things I did door to day was just figuring out how I can get receive Israeli citizenship. The basketball was kind of was kind of in the back of my mind. I've been doing it my whole life. I just knew that once I got citizenship, like the rest of my life would be much easier. Thank you, Jared. Um, and uh, a different question. Um, we have a question. Are you learning Hebrew? How's that process going? So I didn't receive. Uh, I, like I didn't get citizenship as a Jew. So uh, Opon is very kind of expensive here. So right now I'm not learning Hebrew. I'm actually kind of just learning it on the fly. Like my teammates uh, that are locals here, they all speak vivid Hebrew. So I, I can speak like very basic words, very basic conversation, but I plan on learning Hebrew this summer, um, doing trying to take a Hebrew class with my rabbi, but here in Israel, also the time, like my schedule with basketball, it doesn't allow me to like, go full course in on it. So I plan on trying to learn Hebrew this summer. Thank you, Jared. Any final questions? Well, please folks join me in using the reactions button to give uh, a round of applause. And thank you for Jared to joining us. Um, virtually, I know it's it's pretty late in Israel at, at this point. So, Jared, thank you so much for uh, for being here okay. and for sharing your story. So, so candidly, it was just it was so heartbreaking to to hear about the obstacles that have been put in your place when you know Israel was was founded to be a to be a homeland, right, for uh, for Jewish folks. And um, but your story of just determination was was also really inspiring um even while even while um the uh the sort of the path that you had to had to journey was a was a really really uh really sad one to hear about so thank well, you I want to thank I want to thank you guys for having me um like I said this is my first time actually publicly speaking out about it um and I greatly appreciate I hope many of you that are on this zoom get the opportunity to come and see Israel it's a great place um great city and great state that I think many of you would love to live and, you know, build your life here. Um, soon as I got off the plane, I felt like I, this was home for me. And I think that as Jews, this is one of the safest place in the world for us, the safest place in the world for us. And I, even if you don't want to, you know, come live in Israel, it's great that, you know, take a birthright trip to Israel. It's free. Um, it's 10 days and you get the chance to tour and uh, you know, see the country and see if you like it or not. So uh, I hope that this, from this, that you learn, like we all go through adversity and, and life and that, you know, it's not how you go through, it's not how you deal with it, but how you go through it. And I hope that whatever, whenever you guys are having a hardship in life, that you can kind of remember my story to keep pushing and to keep going forward. Thank you so much, Jared. And thank you everyone for joining us, everybody from REL310, our community members. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I'll note it's in the chat that the Sterling Institute also has study abroad programs to Israel with generous scholarships and MSU credits. Um, we can definitely give more information about that. Um, Yael, did you want to say anything about our upcoming programs for the rest of the semester before we log off here today? Oh, I'm um, sure. I think on, um, uh, I, had, I wasn't fully prepared, but I should know everything by heart. We have Vered Weiss, um, one of our professors, uh, giving a talk on her really important um, uh, scholarship on Israeli uh, science fiction and literature. I think that's on April 11th, if I'm not mistaken. Ariana, if you can you, and you have the information, you can put it in the chat. On April 18th, we're having our annual Holocaust lecture and we're having a book discussion and providing free books uh, before that, I believe on uh, April 10th. So anyone would like a free book, um, you can get it at Wells and, uh, and, um, and then read it before 
we have the speaker. And then on April 14th, we're having the annual undergraduate research conference for the Serling Institute. And I think several of you submitted something. If you haven't, we're still collecting titles today and putting out the flyer for that. If you'd like to submit something, uh, please don't be shy. It doesn't have to be a polished paper. It could be a short presentation and we really encourage you to do that. So that, that's all our upcoming events. <laughs> thanks for that. Thanks for that, Professor Iris, the opportunity to talk about that. Thank you, Yael. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but I know you'd rise to the occasion. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. If you're celebrating um, Passover this week, uh, happy Passover. If you're celebrating Easter at the weekend, happy Easter. If you're observing Ramadan, I hope that your fast is a meaningful one. And I think that has covered all of the holidays on the calendar for this week. And uh, REL 310, we'll see you back in class next Monday. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Amaya. Thanks, Amaya.